Well, good morning. Welcome to Temple Bible Church. Um, as you're finding your seat, we're going to just do a few announcements that we have coming up. So there is a church council meeting tonight at 730. Those of you who are a part of that, we're a little hot. Almost, should I step forward or back? I don't know. So, um, so the financials and agendas, for those of you who are on the council members, uh, will be in your mailboxes. So you may want to get those uh, to be prepared. And then August 14th. Um, we will be, uh, the elders uh, are unanimously recommending to the congregation Jeremiah and Kelsey Tomlin for membership. So that's very exciting. Very cool. I'm surprised. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I was a joke. Sorry, I probably shouldn't joke in, in up here on Sunday. Um, anyway, there is also a church picnic coming up August 21st. So Get that in your calendars or grab a bulletin if you would. Um, just keep up to date on some of the things that are coming up. So there is a church picnic August 24th. And then if you could just, those of you who, uh, who received that email about praying for um, our legislators in Indiana, please keep, keep in prayer. Um, so uh, pastor updated me a little bit. Um, it, things did pass, but um, it wasn't, I guess, a, a, the most smooth process. So please keep our state and our legislators and your prayers um, that they would stand strong and that God would continue to move across our state and um, our different counties and, Lord willing, even across our nation. So in other states, that'll be going through the same battle. All right, let's go ahead and pray, and then uh, we'll begin singing in worship. Father, thank you so much for today. You are a great, wonderful God. Um, who should be praised, who is worthy of all of our praise and all of our glory and honor. You are holy. I thank you for sending us and giving us your Holy Spirit. I thank you for your son who died on the cross for our sins. Please, God, be with our pastor as he preaches your word and as he, he, he wants to minister to the lives of, of your children and even maybe, God, uh, that the lost you would remove the blinders from their eyes. You'd allow them to hear the gospel, the message of your truth for the first time. You'd save souls. Please, God, bring forth revival into our hearts. True change, true repentance. And let us leave here this morning changed. In Jesus' name.
May you all bow and pray with me. Father God, we certainly thank you for establishing the marriage relationship. You started it in the very beginning, creating Adam and then taking from Adam to create Eve. And we had a man and woman put together in marriage. And Lord, we just thank you that you put a family together. It would be pretty lonely to be without a helpmate and get through life. And so, God, we just thank you for putting that all together and all your knowledge and then the ability to procreate and, and bring children to a world and to nurture them and, and take them through to, to their own life. And, Lord, we just pray for each family here. We pray that you would give us wisdom that you would give us ability in these times that are so trying in many ways. And Lord, we talked about it in Sunday school where this life isn't always a, a bed of roses here. And as married people and, and individuals, we each make mistakes daily. And Lord, we have to ask you forgiveness and give us wisdom and give us ability to deal with things as they come and that we might be a witness uh, to the world around us, that we might uh, present what Christ is all about to those that we love and see and acquaintances. And Lord, we pray that it would all be done because we love you with all our heart, soul, and mind. For we thank you in Jesus' name for his sacrifice that he made for us. In an amazing way, he stood in for people like us that were sinful and had no way out. We thank you again in Jesus' name. Amen. We want to be able to pray for our wives in our church family. We ask, Lord, that you would be with each one of us that our wives, mothers of families, Lord, you have made us in such a unique way, and we each have our own talents that you have given to us. And we do give you praise that you have used many of our wives throughout our congregation. Thank you for their love for their families as they attend services here. Father, we pray that you will help our, us as wives to be an encouragement to our husbands, to our children, to those that we come in contact with, that our lives would be so radiant with the love of Jesus in our hearts that we could spread it to the wives that we come in contact with. We thank you, Father, that you have taught us to love that we need to love our families, love our husbands, love our children, love the people in our congregations, love those in the world that do not know you. May our love spread in such a way that we could touch hearts and lives that they in turn would come to know the Lord Jesus, that they too could learn the love of God and then, then they can share the love that you have put into their hearts. Father, we also pray that we would be submissive. Be submissive to the Lord. Lord, we pray that we would be faithful wives and mothers in the word of God for the instruction that it gives. Father, we pray that we would encourage our husbands to be the fathers and the dads and the grandpas that they need to be to our families. May they instruct us in our families as to what God has instructed to them, that our families would be a family that loves the Lord and would want to serve the Lord. We pray, Father, for our children. We are instructed in the word that if we raise our children in the Lord, they will return, not return, to, they will return to you. Lord, we thank you for the instruction that we receive through your word. And we do pray that our lives would be 
the kind of a, a life that they would want for themselves. We pray, Lord, that you would guide and direct in their lives. We pray that they would learn to read your word, to be submissive to it, be submissive to the Lord. We thank you for our young people. Lord, for those who have given their lives and their hearts to you, we pray, Lord, that you will continue to work in their hearts, in their lives. Thank you for the little ones that come and learn every Sunday from your word. We pray that many of them will give their hearts to the Lord, that they would want you to be in their lives. We thank you, Father, for the blessings of many of our families. We thank you, Father, for how precious you are to us in times of possibly distress and in times of joy and happiness. You are so faithful, and we give you the praise today for every Christian wife and mother here today. We will give you the praise and the honor for what is to be accomplished, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord Jesus, as we continue in prayer, I think of how you taught the disciples to pray. Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. May your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And Lord, I just pray that as fathers in this room, you would give us the backbone of steel that stands on your word and that gives you the praise, that upholds you as holy, as our God, as our creator, that we would worship in spirit and truth every day of the week and lead our families, our wives, our children in the pursuit, the knowledge of the truth. So I just pray for the energy for the men of this congregation to not just see the physical things that need to get done, but Lord, every day to teach our children, to lead our wives in the way of knowing your word, of being submissive to it. Lord, would you give us discernment? Would you give us the wisdom that sees what is of the world and cuts it off of our homes and takes a stand for what is right? So I just pray that you would give us that great discernment, that we would know how to interact in the world, that you would give us the ability to be gracious and reach out to people and help them to be those who sow your word and are workers in the field of harvest. So thank you for every season of life. Thank you that there are elderly men that are here that are examples of faithfulness over their lives. I thank you, Lord, that there are middle-aged men who are working out yet with their families and, and um, doing, doing a job in the, in the field, whatever that may be. I just pray that you would continue to lead them and guide them in that pursuit. I just pray, Lord, that you would be with the young men that are here, that are growing, that are all the time adding to their understanding. I just pray that you would give them the discernment to know your word and to apply it rightly all throughout their lives. So we thank you for this day and know that you are an all-powerful creator and it, it is from you. And so we give you the thanks for all that you've allowed us to do in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand. We're going to sing How Far My Foundation.
can't help but to hear that song, How Firm a Foundation, and I know with many of you think of J. Vernon McGee, how many times, good to see Eileen, great, it's good to see you Eileen, oh, praise the Lord, that's, that's a joy, it's a joy, so we've prayed for you much, good to see you, and um, oh, that blesses my heart, so thank you for encouraging uh, with, with that. But uh, I was saying with the How Firm a Foundation, many of you grew up perhaps even as I did as a little boy, uh, hearing that on the radio, and so we're thankful. The children, if you're uh, participating in junior church, uh, can be dismissed. Um, I want to encourage you pastorally to just continue to pray for our leadership within the state. It's been uh, a really tough couple weeks, and um, Mike Fechter, who is a director of Indiana Right to Life, which he and I go back as acquaintances or friends, clear back to Evansville uh, 30 years ago, and he issued a statement that he thought what was passed will end 95% of abortions in Indiana. So um, things are not perfect. That's part of uh, legislation and working with a lot of different people from all over the state and different backgrounds, but we rejoice in that. And so continue to pray for our representatives, our senators, our leaders, it's been a, a tough, tough week. I've had uh, personally many conversations with them um, on the phone in person uh, this week. And so uh, I'm thankful for what's been accomplished. Uh, it's not a perfect world, but uh, according to Mike and um, one other representative told me, he said, well, I think it'll be 90%, but the vast majority of abortions uh, at least we'll end in our state. We can't control the other states or can't lead that, but, but continue to pray. I know there are many men and women that are working hard. Um, I know some of them have received death threats personally, and um, it's not easy. So uh, let me just lead us in a word of prayer as we uh, think about our leaders. Father, your word tells us to pray for kings and leaders, all those that are in authority over us so that we might live a peaceful life, not for our pleasure, not for our comfort, but that we may live in a peaceful life, not characterized by being rebellious or cantankerous, and so, Lord, we pray for our leaders that they would make good, righteous decisions. I ask for your physical protection around those who are trying to stand for what is right. And Lord, help us all to be quick to hear and slow to speak, knowing that our anger does not accomplish your righteousness. So I thank you for uh, things that were accomplished in these last days. Uh, Lord, I thank you for the preservation of life. I thank you for this church and what we continue to do to stand behind life, to stand uh, with righteousness and with your word. So, Lord, help us um, to love people wherever they are in whatever circumstances, and may we be faithful to point them to your son, Jesus Christ. So, Lord, help us now as we open the pages of your word, what you wrote down. This is your heart. This is what you recorded and preserved for us so that we would better know you, we would better understand you, and we would more intimately walk with you. So, Lord, I, I recognize that we step into some uh, very sensitive aspects this morning, yet you have spoken into these. And so, Lord, through your spirit, may you take uh, your word and my words and uh, may you apply them to each of our hearts. And we pray it to the end, the end result, that you and you alone would receive the glory. So bless us as we continue to worship in your precious name. Amen. Well, growing up, there was an old country and western song. Uh, some of you like country, others of you uh, may not be your favorite genre. But there was the old song written by the Silver Fox, if any of you remember him, Charlie Rich. And I remember as a kid, as the entitled song was Behind Closed Doors. And there was a chorus, or part of the chorus, 
which he sang because no one knows what goes on behind closed doors. And so this morning, we are going to um, peek behind closed doors, if you will, as we continue this series of Heaven Help the Home. I recognize I'm stepping into a sensitive area in many ways, and I ask Uh, for you to hear me out and try to hear God's word out. And um, I want to ask that if there's things that do not sit well with you or strike a particular painful chord that I would ask that you, that we talk it out, um, that you give me opportunity to clarify, to understand. And, uh, and so I realize that I'm, I'm in a very emotionally uh, sensitive area. And so I do that with great reverence and respect, but yet on biblical grounds because the Bible talks about it. So if I'm going to be fair to preach the whole counsel of God, which I think that most of you want me to do, we've got to look at some passages and aspects of the Bible, but also very practical grounds. Uh, This is an area in which there is great struggle, and we need help from heaven. Uh, We need the help of heaven in our homes. And I I pray that hopefully over these last few weeks as we've we've been in this series that that you're beginning to maybe take a different view of our homes or maybe be refreshed in how you look at it, uh, at our marriages, our families. And and hopefully it's struck a chord that there is hope. Because it's, it's easy for us to look out into the world and our homes and, and even Christian homes and we become very discouraged, depressed, and everything's negative. And, and, and I believe that we can brighten the corner as the old song sings right where we are, right? I, I can't control the world, but I can brighten my corner. I can make a difference where, where I am. And so um, I, I want as the, the landscape of our culture seems uh, very negative and, and perhaps hopeless, I believe there is hope. And that hope comes that if in the words of the prophet Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 32, verse 21, if we hear that voice behind us, and he says, this is the way, walk in it, okay? And, and God said to Isaiah, there will come a time where you'll hear my voice and I'll say, this is the way, walk in it. And don't turn to the left or turn to the right. And so there is encouragement. There's hope for our homes, for your marriage, for your children's marriage, if we'll listen to this voice. Okay, so I pray that encourages you. And just to kind of refresh, some of you uh, have not been with us or, or just to remind you that we've been, we started from the very beginning about God-centered homes. And we need to, again, bow and bend the knee in humility unless the Lord builds the house. And there were certain expressions of, and we're not trying to go back to a bygone era, but, but there were values, there were principles about, you know, some of our grandparents used to talk about the family altar, and, and, and there was a sense in which homes were centered around God. They were not perfect, but they recognized that unless the Lord does it, Everything else we do is worthless. And so we need to get back to God-centered homes. And and I started a few weeks ago and and reminding us, and I continue to do so, that we have to to push out the voice of the world of this competition in marriage, this competition between men and women and male and female. And it's not a competition. It's a compliment, okay? So quit competing, and embrace the compliment, the differences. And we saw the last couple of weeks that marriage, in fact, is a dramatic picture. It is a fleshed out drama of God in us. We saw that, that really the, the relationship with the church, Paul says, really, that's, that's pictured in the marriage. The marriage is supposed to be a picture of our relationship with God. And we saw that roles have been delegated, assigned to husbands as loving servant leaders. They are to play the role of Christ. And that the role has been assigned to wives of that of the church 
to honor and affirm the leadership, to live in such a way that they cooperate. And, and Paul tells us that, listen, when we, when we live out this dramatic picture, that God's plan is fulfilled and fleshed out in this world. And so I, I take the time to remind you all this, to keep coming back, that there is a plan and a purpose of why God did this. And we can't just arbitrarily, and, and maybe perhaps, you know, even as we've been reviewing in Sunday school, that perhaps this evolutionary thinking has even crept into our homes in relationship to marriage. We, we're just not thinking that this is a God thing designed by him with a plan and a purpose. And if we're willing to see it from that perspective, and we'll see even more intimately today, if we're willing to see it from that perspective, suddenly we begin to flesh out, to show to the world a perfect, loving, intimate relationship. Not in our human imperfection, but that relationship with God. And so this morning, if you would take your Bible and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, we begin to peek behind, using Charlie Rich's words, the closed doors of marital intimacy. And I believe that what was created and intended by God to be an expression of this intimate communion and connection with him, one of mutual blessing, has come to the point where it's become the battle of the bedroom. It would rank right up there with any WWE or WWF uh, great smackdowns or royal battles. But we have gotten to the point where this is the battle in the bedroom. And again, I contend that we have lost a sense of perspective. We've lost the, sense, the foundation. And so as we step into this area, and I think perhaps for just a moment, it might be worth asking or, or answering a, a background question. Have you ever even thought about this? Why in the fact do we even have physical bodies? Do you, you ever stop to think of that question? You see, God is spirit, right? So he could have created a bunch of spirits without physical bodies. We know the, the angels are ministering spirits. They don't have a physicality like we do. They can apparently take on human forms or possess human forms, but it's not part of their order. They're part of their creation. So why did he make us physical beings that we are in fact not complete if we don't have a physical body? And so 1 Corinthians chapter 7, if you just let your eyes drift up to the end of chapter 6 in verse 20, Paul writes, for you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. God did not create a physical, material, tangible universe without a plan or purpose. There is a theological background and it's worth us for just a moment to step back and say, okay, wait a second. What was God doing? You see, this was not haphazard. It was not by accident. It was not just a process or a series of evolution. But God had a plan and a purpose. And his plan or his purpose was to externalize, flesh out, manifest his visible attributes. Or excuse me, his invisible attributes. What we cannot see, God said, I'm going to... I'm going to flesh it all out. And so Psalm 19 verse 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God and the sky proclaims his handiwork. You see, all of creation speaks. And it speaks about the things of God which we cannot see. Now, we realize and we were reminded this morning in Sunday school class that we live in this world that is scarred, is broken, but yet it is still 
bearing the image of God or the reflection. And I believe that our bodies, okay, fit in that same category of physical things. God created us physically for the reason of manifesting his glory. So Paul writes, listen, you've been bought with a price, that's through the death of Jesus Christ, and human beings and human bodies were intended to flesh out his invisible attributes. And it was most fully seen in the image of his son, Jesus Christ. We beheld his glory, John says, the glory of the only begotten of the Father. And Jesus came and he lived, he loved, and he gave himself so that he could purchase back humanity So that humanity might again fulfill that purpose of fleshing God out. Now, I say all this theological background because we're going to talk about physical intimacy. And I think it needs to be in that context. That the reason he gave us a physicality and the reason Christ purchased us back is so that 1 Corinthians 6.21, that we might glorify God in our bodies. We've been bought with the precious price of his son so that our bodies might too reflect his glory. Therefore, Paul says, glorify God in your body. So that theological background that I just tried to explain is important because it comes into play when there is that intimate connection Our bodies were intended as vessels of expression, vessels of communication, vessels of manifestation of God's character. And so we get to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and the church at Corinth, much like the church today, was filled with lots of confusion confusion about many things, but one of the points of confusion was marriage. The Corinthian confusion was so across the board, they they were, what is marriage? How how does marriage work? If you're in a marriage, should you leave the marriage? Now that I'm, you say I'm, I'm united with Christ, I'm married to him, well then maybe I shouldn't be married to this person. And this person doesn't even agree with that. They're not even claiming faith in Christ, so maybe I just ought to ban the marriage. And, and in fact, there were about four different legal types of marriage. There's a traditional marriage we think is husband and wife to one man and one woman. But there were also three other types of marriage depending on your status, and we're not going to go through it this morning. But there was a lot of confusion in society, same as there is today. You know, can I marry somebody of my same gender? Is there, what is gender? How many genders are there? There there were tons of confusion. So they, in fact, wrote a series of questions to the Apostle Paul. Now, we're unfortunate we don't have those questions. We only have Paul's response. So we only have half of the dialogue. But we see that Paul begins to address this in verse 1 of chapter 7. Now, concerning the things about which you wrote, is it good for a man not to touch a woman? So they wrote some questions and they wrote about this not to touch a woman. Now, I want to clarify that this not touching a woman was means, I, you mean I can't hug my mom or I can't hug my daughter? Okay, it's a euphemism, okay? To touch a woman, talk, it's a euphemism for intimate relationships. So they're, they're asking or wrestling with this question, is it, is it best to just not even have intimate relationships? Now, we're, scholars are pretty well divided 50-50. Is this a statement that they were saying, hey, it's good not to touch a person, not to be intimate, even if you're married? Or was that something that Paul was, he had said and he says, well, it's, it's good, but if you're not gifted that way, in, in verse 6 and 7, you know, Paul wasn't married, but hey, if you're not gifted like me, everyone is gifted differently, verse 7. So is it a 
statement by them or is this something that Paul had said that now he has to clarify? Scholars are divided, but I think when we get to the answer, the response is still the same. Either way, the issue of being celibate within marriage or celibate without marriage, just not, or Paul, that if you're not gifted, then I think we still get to the same answer. And look with me at verse 2. But because of immoralities, each man is to have his own wife, and each woman is to have her own husband. Paul gives an answer that there is a mutual reciprocation. Each person has each other. Whether they were trying to promote some form of celibacy, either don't ever get married, or if you're married, then you can't have physical relationships, or whether Paul was clarifying, he comes to the point that our marriage has been ordained in order to maintain purity and preservation in a world that is putrefying. Marriage is something that we saw a few weeks ago, God designed, God ordained, and it serves a role in a world that is decaying and falling apart. And one of the roles that it has is in order to maintain a purity and a preservation in the midst of this distorted world. There's several purposes for marriage. We've already alluded and somebody mentioned this morning there, I think it was Dan, there is a reality of, of procreation that marriage was designed by God as the vehicle in which we would be fruitful and multiply, right? That's what he told Adam and Eve. So he designed it as, a, as he did to be able to reproduce, to procreate. We saw a few weeks ago that one of the other things about how he designed marriage, that it's a dramatic picture. It's a lived out drama of his relationship with us. Paul says, you know, I'm talking about marriage, but I'm really talking about Christ and the church. This marriage is a dramatic picture of Christ and the church. But one of the other things of marriage in this world, it is one of the ways in which God is intending to preserve a purity and preserve a relationship in a world that is broken and decaying. You see, one of the things about the marital relationship, when everything else, if I can use the phrase, is going to hell in a handbasket, everything else is falling apart, God intended this to be an intimate connection, a pure relationship, that preserves this picture in this lost world. In a world that's broken and distorted in relationships, there is intended to be a safe haven, a home, a place of connection to protect and preserve God's beauty. Unfortunately, we've allowed so much of the world and its competition and its lustful perspectives to creep into the bedroom that now it's become a battleground rather than a solace and a place of communion and connection. Now I want to clarify, I'm not saying that God ever intended marital intimacy and that connection that it satisfies every longing of a broken world. It was never intended to fill our lustful passions. It was never intended to fill every desire that I have. I'm not saying that. It was never intended to well, I get what I want in this world because frankly, my wanter may not be godly. But what I am saying is this relationship was intended 
to preserve something special in a pure and loving way. And so if I can say it this way, sexual connection within marriage is at the very heart a picture of what God intends because it expresses his intimate bond with us which is intended to exist between a husband and a wife. That's a lot of words and a lot of thought there. But this intimate connection, in fact, was intended to be a connecting point to preserve and picture his relationship with us. In fact, he wrote an entire book of the Bible about it, okay? So turn with me to Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon or Song of Songs. I doubt that it's Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. It's probably been a while since you've um, read this. And in fact, I'm contemplating that um, Terry and Melinda do such a fabulous job in scripture reading. They sincerely do. I mean that sincerely. Um, that maybe we'll just schedule some Song of Solomon readings over the next few weeks, and this will be our scripture reading. But, but let's, let's read God's word together, okay? And so look with me at Psalm 4, excuse me, Song of Solomon chapter 4. How beautiful you are, my darling, how beautiful you are. Your eyes are like the doves behind your veil, your hair is like a flock of goats that have descended from Mount Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of newly shorn ewes, which have come up from their washing, all which bear twins, and not one of them has lost her young. So I'm thankful you haven't lost any teeth. That's so beautiful to me, okay? You still have all of them there. Verse 3, your lips are like a scarlet thread, and your mouth is lovely. Your temples are like a slice of pomegranate behind your veil. Your neck is like the Tower of David, built with rows of stone on which are hung a thousand shields, and the round shields of the mighty men, verse 5. Your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle, which feed among the lilies. Until the cool of the day when the shadows flee away, I will go away to the mountain of myrrh, and the hill of frankincense. You are altogether beautiful, my darling, and there is no blemish in you. Come with me from Lebanon, my bride. May you come with me from Lebanon. Journey down from the summit of Amman and from the summit of Sinir and Hermon. Now, let me just pause there. Just unless you thought that he was doing a Palestinian travel journal, okay? He was not planning on taking a bus across Palestine. Okay? He's using euphemisms here. Okay? So he talks about the mountains, and we're going to come down from the mountains and go on a journey. Verse 9, you have made my heart beat faster, my sister, my bride. You've made my heart beat faster with a single glance of your eyes, with a single strand of your necklace. How beautiful is your love, my sister, my bride. How much better is your love than wine and the fragrance of your oils than all kind of spices. Your lips, my bride, drip honey. Honey and milk are under your tongue. And the fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of Lebanon. A garden locked is my sister, my bride, a rock garden locked, a spring sealed up. Your shoots are an orchard of pomegranates with choice fruits, henna with nard plants, nard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon with all the trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloes and along with the... Now, unless you think he was reflecting on cooking or something. Okay, you, you get my point. God recorded in his word the beauty of a marriage relationship which I believe the intent of Song and Solomon is to picture his love for us and then the bride answers and touch and says how much she loves her husband and she, she loves his leadership and his strength. 
And what I'm saying this, and, and, and again, it's very graphic. Again, he's not talking about seasonings and cookings, and he's not talking about traveling on an exotic vacation. He's talking about the beauty of an intimate relationship. Now, if you, if you love the reading of Scripture this morning, okay, we had plenty of reading. We're going to have some more, okay? It's God's Word. But I want you to stop and think for a moment. If physical intimacy was, intimacy was only about procreation, God, God could have just said, you know, I just created so that two people put their fingers together and lo and behold, a baby. <laughs> now, you might think I'm being a little silly, but God could have done that, right? But he didn't. So what did God do? God designed it in such a way that two people come together and they're so intertwined that if you don't look closely, you may think it's just one person. And those two become one, echad, the Hebrew word, which is used to describe God himself, that God is echad, he's one. And God said, I'm going to so intertwine these people so that they're close, they're intimate, they're connected because that's reflecting you and me. I want us intimate and connected. And so God created this physicality in such a way that it reflects an intimate bond, a union that reflects his relationship with us. Now, there's joy and there's pleasure, but there ought to be joy and pleasure in our relationship with the Lord. And so my point in spending time is we have to come back and rethink this because we have been so molded and shaped by the world that we can't even think of physical intimacy as it was intended and was created. That bond and that connection, that's what God intended. Now, it is felt in different ways by the two halves, because again, we're, we're complementing each other. We're not competing, right? And so he created a maleness and he created a femaleness and, and there's different perspectives. There's different ways in which that is felt. But I really think there's, there's a couple things that I, this morning, and, and I could, I could do several messages on this and I could, preach at length, but I want, I want to point out a couple things that I perhaps I think have been neglected or misunderstood because we together as men and women, as husbands and wives, we live in a deep, dark, lonely, broken world. Um, for an unsaved world, this is the only heaven they'll ever know, right? This is as good as it gets. For believers, this is the only hell we'll ever know. And sometimes it's reflective of that. And I believe that God intended this marital connection to be a retreat from this broken world Several years ago, um, Shanti Feldman, I have a couple of her books, if any of you want to borrow them or read, but her, her first one that she wrote, it's called For Women Only, and it was based on some research that she did and just listening and talking to both sides, okay, to men and how they think and they feel and their perspectives, and likewise, she wrote a second one for men only uh, to women but it's the, the, particularly the for, for men only um, is just an, or excuse me, for women only, I think is a very insightful book. 
And in that, she talks about that uh, many men, even those with close friendships, seem to live with a deep sense of loneliness that is quite foreign to us so relational women. And making love is the purest salve for that loneliness. Frankly, I think most women don't realize that. That in a doggy dog world, a world where I fight, where I claw, where I don't have many friends, and sometimes even amongst friends, it's competition, that the intimate connection in marriage is a salve for the loneliness that's, a, that's filled in the world. She goes on to say, that the classic not tonight dear that he hears your what husbands hears is you're so undesirable that you can't compete with a pillow and i really don't care about what matters deeply to you this no is not a no to sex as she might feel it it is creating a feeling of personal rejection and there's a sense that his wife doesn't really desire him I've chosen to include a couple of these quotes because I think she's very insightful from a men's perspective. And I realized this morning that there are many perspectives and I can't represent them all, but these are a few. But um, over 30 plus years of ministry and counseling and working with lots of marriages and as well struggling through my own things. I think this is quite often something that women don't don't realize that when when a wife stiff arms her husband that many times it's heard as a rejection of him as a person Women quite often primarily connect closeness through verbal communication. I just want him him to talk to me, right? Quite often, women, that's the way you connect. You just want him to talk, you know? Let's just talk together. It doesn't have to be about anything specific. Let's just talk. Can you imagine going for days or weeks or months without your husband talking to you, you would feel rejected. On the other side, when there's not intimate connection, I know countless men have felt equally rejected. You see, women connect intimately verbally. Men tend to connect intimately physically. And so I just ask you to um, rethink. And I'm going to share some verses, uh, at least one, that physical touch or closeness is, for many men, a primary way of connection. Um, And I realize I'm way past in a sensitive subject here, and I I realize that some of you might think, well, hey, I don't feel I'm being represented, and, and I know there's many facets to this, but I, I, think, I think we need to realize that we started to try to understand that this is an intimate connection. And when there's not verbal communication, one side can feel rejected. When there's not a physical connection. And that doesn't mean that it always has to end at a certain point or a certain climax, but when there's not a physicality, it can be heard or felt as if you don't want me. Proverbs chapter 5 says these words, Drink water from your own cistern and fresh water from your own well. Should your springs be dispersed to abroad, streams of water in the the streets, 
Let them be yours alone and, and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth as a loving hind and a graceful doe. Let her breast satisfy you at all times. Be exhilarated always with her love. Some time ago I had one husband tell me, I'd love to be satisfied with my wife's breast, but I don't have access to them. Now, by me saying that, I'm not objectifying. That's not what I was meaning. But what I am saying is that we've brought our secular battles into the bedroom, and it's become a battlefield. For some, for some, it's a way of manipulation and control. I'll control this marriage one way or another, and that's a lever I have... For others, and I'm going to assume this morning, for maybe some of you, it's just I didn't understand. So, so this is not, please hear me out. I can repeat it a dozen times. I'm not intending to objectify anyone or anything. I'm trying to help us understand the dynamic of relationships. And the scriptures, we could read many more passages. The scriptures talk about this physical, intimate connection. And we'll see in just a moment that it is intended to be a part of, of the normal marriage relationship. But when it is cut off or circumvented or not appreciated, it does in fact hurt the relationship and it hurts the image that it's intended to reflect. Let me summarize it this way. Physical intimacy within marriage is intended to be a mutual ministry. This was never intended to be a battlefield, but in fact, turn back with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Paul goes on to say in verse 3, the husband must fulfill his duty to his wife and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority of her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, also, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Paul says, listen, this is on even ground. One is not higher than the other. One is not more in control. It is mutual ministry. He, he does, in fact, use a, a, a very strong word. And if we're not careful, this can be distorted as well. He says, listen, you have a duty. That can be understand in the sense of, of a debt. You have a debt to be paid to your spouse. Oh, okay, well, man, I got to pay my debt. I mean, who wants to be, who, 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 who wants to be a deadbeat? That didn't? Okay, he's, he uses strong language to communicate the seriousness of it. But he wasn't intended to communicate an obligatory attitude, okay? So if you approach your spouse, either way, okay, I got to do my duty. No. What he's saying is this is serious, okay? The same way as you would not want to shirk on a legal obligation, this is a serious responsibility, And so this is not to communicate some begrudging relationship, but rather this is serious. And this is about mutually ministering to one another. And so look with me at verse 5. Stop. Stop depriving one another. Now the intent was, and this is where I think I take a little bit more of the angle they had had come up with some kind of a celibacy, well, if we're really going to be spiritual in marriage and you're not even a believer, then I don't. In fact, some scholars go so far as to say that they thought that some people would begin to move out and live separately because, well, you're not, I'm married to Jesus, I'm not married to you, and they were depriving. And Paul says, stop. Stop depriving. As I mentioned, some perhaps do for power, for control. I'll just, I'll show him or I'll show her. 
for others, it's just I didn't, I didn't really understand this. In fact, I, Pastor Jeff, I've never even heard a message about this. And for others, I realize that you, you, may, be, you may be busy, you may be tired, but you know what? The dishes will eventually get done. You see, it's an issue of what's most important. And in fact, maybe he might help you clean the house if there was some sense of this is really important or she might be more eager to do other things if, you see, it has to be first things first. And Paul said, this is really important. He, d- he didn't write about vacuuming your house. He didn't write about doing the dishes. He didn't write about th- those things. They work out. And I'm not talking about bargaining. I'm just trying to talk about the principles of a mutuality. He goes on to say that there may be a time don't deprive one another except by agreement for a time. You, you, you agree that, hey, look, okay, right now, based on whatever circumstances, so we mutually agree so that, okay, and then this is so serious that you're going to dedicate yourselves to prayer so that you might devote yourselves to prayer. You know, listen, if it's not serious enough to pray about, then it's not serious enough to stop. But even in that, when it's serious and we need to pray, we need to get on our knees and we need to pray about whatever the situation is. He says, and then you come back together so that Satan will not tempt you. There needs to be mutual consent. There needs to be prayer, but it needs to be brief. Let me just summarize this together. That I think Paul's words about the Christian life in Galatians 5.13 For you are called to freedom in Christ, brothers and sisters. Only don't turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but serve one another through love. Again, there are many things that I could talk about, the physical intimacy. In fact, I I go so as far, and there's some inferences from scripture that I think that he even created us in our physical biological responses I I even I think those are innuendos those are reflection of God how how wives respond and how men respond that they 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 depict even God himself now those are some deep subjects and get to the details but what I am saying this morning is that God's called us in our homes, in our marriages, to reflect his image in an intimate connection and communion. And it is a way in which we can physically minister to each other and truly love one another so that a world doesn't look at our marriages and see a battleground, but they see a reflection of God's love for his people. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I I know this morning that I've only in some ways touched the tip of the iceberg of this big and complicated subject. But Lord, I pray that you would help us from heaven to better understand this physical dynamic of how it really is a connection and it it, it reflects you and us. And Lord, I pray that there would be a redemption, a redeeming of the physical relationships within our marriages. That there might again be that sense of love and nurturing and care and connection that helps us feel and sense your love for us. So Lord, help us. We so desperately need your help from heaven. And unless, unless you build everything else that we might do 
is worthless. So Lord, bless our homes, I pray, in your precious name. Amen. Let's stand in clothing, closing and sing just the chorus, all glory be to Christ. And we're going to sing it um, together, a cappella, all glory be to Christ. All glory be to Christ our King. All glory be to Christ. His rule and reign will ever sing. All glory be to Christ. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.